Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello? Hi. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ivan. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, really, really glad to be here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Jordan from the bottom of my heart for honoring me and having, like, asking me to be here. Like, when he asked me, I was like, when you asked me, I was honored, as I always am, when, when I get the chance to, like, tell what you guys have, and God have done in my life. But after meeting the Fox family, I am humbled that you allowed me the opportunity to share, like, forget the speaking. Like, this is just gravy. Meeting all of you, like in less than 72 hours, I can see so many faces. You know who you are. Thank you for those, those little moments we've shared. The laughter, the healing, the, 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 cause I'm telling you, there's something that happens when like, God hears it, when like souls are craving Him and we gather. It's palpable. Like, I shared that word with someone earlier, palpable. Like, you know who you are. I'm like, yeah, that's exactly how I just described it. It's palpable. And I, like, if you're like, what does he mean by palpable? I'll tell you. My brain's got nothing to do with it. My heart is the one that goes, ping. God's in the building. You know what I mean? Like, like how do I know it? It's like, telltale signs. I've teared up at least 24 times in the last 72 hours. At least, you know, like that, like when you do that uncomfortable, I'm about to cry, shift, like, <laughs> all the shares, all the speed, and then like forget the goosebumps. There are like so many goosebumps, so many moments with goosebumps where literally like my heart goes like, yeah, Ivan, you know that that thing that saved you? He's with these people. I feel him. I feel him, Ivan. So like, thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Because in the last 72 hours, I'm like... My heart is brimming. Like, when I get up there, I'm like, I just need to stay calm. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I just need to stay calm because I, I love this deal. Like, I love this deal. Like, I love it the way I love oxygen. You know what I mean? Like, I get up here, I'm like, all right, what? what? Like, okay, okay, just begin at the beginning. Like, first and foremost, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Iris, for being such gracious hosts. These guys have been amazing. And to all of you, I've had like the best weekend in the world. And of course, for like for a lot of it is like I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? Like I fell in love with it. And like I fell in love with the God that I found here. So what I'm going to try to do is like literally almost tell you a love story. You know what I mean? Like how I, how this God found me because like the God that you guys are allowing me to feel right now, I don't have the capacity to look for. Like he's, he's writing in color. I'm dreaming in black and white. You know what I mean? Like I don't have the capacity to go search for what you guys are filling me with right now. I don't, but I have the capacity to receive it. And the, 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 the fact that I can receive it is what I've fallen in love with because it gets to a part of my soul that my head and my logic can't mess with. Like I was talking with Jordan yesterday, and I'm like, we're engineers and like logically, logically, what I'm feeling right now makes no sense. I'm sitting with a bunch of strangers that I've known for less than 72 hours and I'm happier than any amount of money I've ever made in my entire life. I'm happier than any promotion I've ever received. And it's not just happiness because I know happiness. You know what I mean? Like when my salary tripled, I was happy. You know what I mean? I was happy. But this is that contentment. You know what I mean? That thing I was looking for at the bottom of every bottle and every drink. This is that. Ah. <sighs> I'm home. And you don't have to convince me. You don't have to sit me down and tell me thoughts is, is a great place. My heart goes, shut him up. Shut that head up real quick. Sit down and take this in, Ivan. Because pretty soon you'll be back on a plane. And you'll get back on that plane and you'll get, you'll get to the airport and you'll get off the plane and you'll just be like, ah, where the hell is my Uber? Why did it? And all of this, 
will be slowly gone from here and you'll have to remember all the laughs and all the moments and all the memories. But until then, here I am, here you are, and here we are. You know what I mean? And so like, that's what I'm in love with. I'm in love with that. Cause like my God is, he's kinetic, you know, like, like, correct, like he's the Emmy. So correct me if I like saying it is wrong, but like my God's kinetic, right? Like, here's what I mean by kinetic. Like, here's my phone right now. Nothing's happening. Okay. Don't break in that the distance between me dropping it and hit hitting the floor. That's kinetic energy, right? So the God I fall in love with the God you guys have put inside me. That's how he is. He's a result of motion. It's like sweat. You know what I mean? Like th- this God I'm feeling right now. I can't think it. It's like telling me to go like, like me sitting and like sweat. <laughs> I can't, I gotta do some sweat. You know what I mean? And so like when I say God, that's the God I'm talking about. He's kinetic. He's the relative of motion. He's the relative of mixing with my fellow miracles, hearing you, listening to you, um, relating to you, loving you, you loving me, like me going, wow, I am so fortunate and so lucky just to be in the presence of such miracles. And in that moment, <sighs> so let me tell you how I fell in love. All right, so I was born in Uganda, East Africa in 1982. Why do I bring up my childhood? Very simple. Like, other people, like, have all these, like, um, they have to find signs of why they don't belong in the world, right? But for me, it was, like, way more drastic than that. So, like, Africa's, Uganda especially is tribal. So, like, there's, like, in Uganda, there's a bunch of tribes. But here's the significance of that. There's like two major tribes in Uganda. There's like subtribe, but there's two major tribes. And what they do about every 30 years is like one of them goes and starts a guerrilla war, right? Starts a civil war, takes over the government, and then tries to kill all the others. And then another 30 years, the other they just keep switching sides, right? So then my mom is from one of these tribes. My dad is from the opposite tribe, right? So then <laughs> my dad's like a politician is like a super powerful senator. Like he, he ran for president of Uganda like, and has multiple times. So he's a big super politician. My mom's like this absolutely stunningly gorgeous, like model, air hostess, super beautiful woman, right? But from the opposite tribe. So at this time, my dad's tribe's in power. My mom's tribe is about to go, they call it going to the bush. Basically just getting a bunch of guns and just going to start to fuck shit up. It's going to start a war. So right after, so they, my mom's tribe goes to the bush to start the war in October of 1981. I was born January of 1982. My mom picks the politician from the opposite tribe to have a child with. But not only that, he has his own family and it's an affair. So she picks the worst possible guy. So literally, as I'm being born, my dad in his office is trying to hunt down people from my mom's tribe to kill because they're <laughs> starting a revolution. So my mom's side of the family is like, what are you doing even talking to this guy? And my dad's like, that's not my baby. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, from the day I was, like the minute I popped out, it was very evident that no, I wasn't really convenient <laughs> to anyone around me. You know what I mean? Like, except maybe my mom. But either way, I'm like, my, my mom's side of the family is going like, Monica, how could you? Of all people, that guy. Like, he's trying to kill us. Now you're going to have a baby with him. My dad's like, I don't know that woman. Like, that's not my child. So from as far back as I can remember, for me, it was no one... No one wanted me around. Like, it wasn't hard to find evidence that I didn't belong. It wasn't hard to find evidence that I wasn't good enough. I was a bastard love child. You know what I mean? With a dad that didn't want me. A mom, my mom was drinking at the time. Uh, she got sober later, but she was drinking heavily at the time. So I have an alcoholic mom, a dad that doesn't want me. My mom's had a family that doesn't know what to do with me. They kind of almost have to hide me. Like, so it was very evident. Like, I get fed last. We're living in other people's homes where you name it, dude. Like... But for whatever reason, so my mom's drinking, but my, my childhood was just all manner of poverty. You know what I mean? And there's a poverty when you starve and there's a poverty when you don't own anything. And Uganda is a very patriarchal society. So for me, not having a father and especially like 
it's worse when like <laughs> I had like a ghost dad, but I had like the worst kind of ghost dad because people like we know who your dad is, but no one's gonna say his name. <laughs> you know what I mean? And like, <laughs> so it was like this twisted like. All right, I get it. I get it. I'm I'm a bastard love child. I I get it. You know what I mean? And um, my mom's drinking her life away. And, and normally, what happens to a child born to the mother I was born to, and the father I was born to, in the situation I was born to, in the country I was born to, at the time that I was born, gets sent to the village to just die. Honestly. And by death, I don't mean like dying. You just kind of shove you away into the, the rural parts where you, you'll get no education and just kind of fade away. And that should have been my destiny. But for whatever reason, I was really good in school. Like to everyone's shock and amazement. For whatever reason, every time I'd study, every time I'd take a test, I'd do really well. I had this like strange, un, this is <laughs> unbelievable command of the English language. Like everyone's like, who taught him English? Like who taught him how to read? Who taught him this? Who taught me that? Like I went to a missionary school, like based on charity. Like it made no sense. But what would happen is when I would take a test along with all the other kids that who had parents, who had a mom, a dad, a house, and a car, who had everything, I would beat them all. For whatever reason. So before they, they like, as, as life goes on and mom's drinking everything away and our lives are going to hell, like, they're getting ready to, to do what happens to bastard love childs of Ugandan politicians. Um, they call my aunt in, in New York and they're like, ah, but you see, we can't send, Mo maybe we can send Monica, my mom, but this boy, this boy is really sharp. So for whatever reason, they were like, we can't let this boy waste away. Because I was scoring like top in the nation. Like that's how out of control it was. It was just to everyone's shock. So the, my aunt, my aunt Khan is like, all right, if you guys can find your way to America, you can come stay with me. So here's what mom does. We take, we sell everything we have, which wasn't very much, but we like all chips in, bro. We sell everything we have, get to one way tickets. Buy two one-way tickets to America. And I'll never forget the day my mom walks in to, like, the little room we're sharing. And she's got those two passports. And she says, Morrissey? By the way, oh, yeah, let me explain that. Ivan is the name I got when I came to America. I'm going to be saying Morrissey because that's my African. That's my given name. My mom calls me Morrissey. So when I say Morrissey, that's, that's who I'm talking about. So my mom comes in the door and she's like, Morrissey, we're going to America. And I didn't know much about America because I grew up, I came through like in Uganda at, at the end of the Civil War. It's not like now where they have YouTube and this was like in 1994. So America was like, all I'd seen about America was like a bunch of like Cosby show reruns, like filled with KFC commercials and McDonald's commercials and so, and like uh, Tom and Jerry cartoons, but were like, so people would come from America every one, like once a year and they'd bring like two VHS tapes. So every year you'd get a VHS tape. So we'd watch like the same six Cosby Show and Tom and Jerry episodes. I kid you not, maybe 200 times before the next batch came. So all I knew about America was like six McDonald's commercials, like three KFC commercials, the Cosby Show and Tom and Jerry. You know what I mean? And so when my mom comes like two one-way tickets to America, all I, all I really knew was anything was better than the way I was living. Anything was better than how we had been living. So we come to America. We buy two the, those two one-way tickets, come to America. And I'll tell you what, man. The, like, the, the only downside to being born in America is you never get to come to America. So, like, <laughs> you, know, you don't understand. Like, I came, I, I, in 94, the Civil War had ended in 88. In 88. And you, you got to understand what a Civil War does. Like, there's nothing after a Civil War. There's no store like like most Americans have grown up with the idea of like stores have always been there. That's not how I grew up. Like stores kind of appeared as I grew up. I kid you not. So for me, something as basic as a store where you go buy sugar and there'll be sugar. And then stores like kind of exaggerating. Like, I don't know. Take like that's like that cubicle there and like take some wooden shelves and like put some items on it 
that was a store for me. Like they'd give me a couple of coins and I'd go buy – and we'd buy sugar like <laughs> – sugar by like <laughs> – in like little <laughs> – little cut – like polyurethane bags, like like literally, like you go buy sugar and they wait, put it on a scale, and that's how you buy sugar. So I like by the time I leave Uganda, that's how I'd go buy sugar. So when I come to America, it's out of control. Like I remember going on like a highway overpass, and it was like a roller coaster because I'd never seen anything like the roads are on top of roads are on top of roads, and my aunt starts going up, and I'm like literally like like the, the same way I grab literally like grabbing the side of the door like whoa. Whoa, we are going on top of the road. The road's on top of the road. I don't to come down. I remember getting, I remember getting my, like I'd seen those McDonald's commercials. So like I was trying to be polite. And every time we drive by like the golden arches, I'm like, Big Mac. <laughs> Big Mac. And like with my Ugandan accent, like I sound American now, but I came with a heavy, I'm like, Big Mac. No, that's no, Big Mac. And I remember getting that first Big Mac, and I'm telling you, from where I came from, the thing was like the size of the Empire State Building. <laughs> I'd never seen food like this. It was humongous. I remember like getting the, like opening it up. I'm like, this one layer and a piece of meat. Oh my God. And then I'd pull, I'm like, there's another one. And I pull, I'm like, there's another one. And I'm like, you know what I mean? Then I'd go to K. I finally get to go to KFC because I'd seen that stupid commercial. I don't know, like maybe a thousand times. I get to go to KFC and I remember getting the, um, the drumstick original recipe. <laughs> I remember lifting the drumstick. And to me, like you, this, because I came in, I grew up in Uganda, like before all this industrialized whatever. So like, we had like real organic chicken, and real organic, like like range fed, like Ugandan range fed is absolutely disgusting. First of all, it's not white; it's like this brownish texture. It's sticky, and if you've eaten real organic chicken, you know what I'm talking about. So by the time I land on this drumstick, to me it was like the size of a human leg. You know what I mean? Like, we're grabbing and it's all this oil is just pouring down my face and it's like, I didn't even want a napkin. I'm like just trying to lick back the oil. You know what I mean? It was like pure deliciousness. I'm like in the land of milk and honey. And it literally felt like it. So then now, now, we're, now we're in America and then, um, we're living with my aunt. And so like, like for me, it's like where my experience with, like, with God begins because from my earliest days, from my earliest days, like, my mom were like was she was I don't want to say emasculated that's not the right word but like her parental rights were kind she kind of gave them away the day we came to America like we lived with my aunt and so my so I I was like self reliance was all I had you know what I mean like I was thrown to the wolves from the day I was born it, it wasn't like I didn't have a choice about self reliance so I, I knew from like the minute I got on that plane to come to America that like the only reason I was still eating the only reason I was still alive was because of my brain the only reason I still existed was because I relied on myself so for me getting good grades and getting an education wasn't a pro wasn't like to be a good student it was simple survival my this intellect, my brain, my self-reliance was my ticket to freedom, literally, literally. And as gracious as my aunt was and as amazing as she was, I understood the reason Monica and Morrissey came. The reason they're in this house is because this boy is good, because this boy can read. And when I came to America, I didn't disappoint. I excelled. I excelled. I excelled. I, they, they would be calling. They would call me into the, the. I remember my guidance counselor calling me and saying, "Where'd you learn English? It's so good." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's how it, obnoxious it was compared to, because when you looked at where I came from, it made no sense. So for me, it was like the idea of self reliance was grained in me. It was like from, but. It was like, for me, like, from where else am I supposed to find my sustenance apart from myself? You know, my mother, my, my dad had denied me. My mother was just drinking her life away. And then in that time thing at, at, at Auntie Connie's place, my mom is still drinking and she ends up getting kicked out. And, and I remember distinctly the day that, like, my Aunt Connie's like, the boy can stay, but you have to go. And my mom gets kicked out of the house and I stay in that house and I, 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 I live and, 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 um, here's what I did. Like for me and mom, the, uh, for me and mom, the, 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 um, 
the understanding was always our only hope in life was for me to get an education. Like it, it wasn't a question of like, I get, no, no. Like we had nothing. Like we have, no, like we had nothing. So I studied, I studied and guess, and then I, I end up fulfilling our dream. I get a full scholarship. I get a full academic scholarship to Iowa State University. And I fulfill our dream. And I remember the day the scholarship comes and mom is so proud and everyone is excited. And it was an amazing day getting that letter. But some, like a little while before I get, no, I'm not sure, a little after I get that letter. This is senior year, senior year in high school. A little after I get that letter. Like, first of all, I was a geek in high school, like uber geek. Like the, the closest allegory I can give you is Steve Urkel. You know Steve Urkel? <laughs> Laura, Laura, that, that was me. And that's what Americans called me, and that's how Americans torment, tormented me. Like, I, I, would, I would be I'm like, who the hell is Laura? Why did not you say Laura, Laura? And then I get home one day, and, I'm, and then Family Matters comes on, and there's that buffoon. You know what I mean? Like, Hi, Laura. I'm like, oh, my God. So that's what I was. And so these kids think it's funny. Like, let's get – they're basically like, let's get Steve Urkel high. And that's exactly what they did. And as a joke, they sell me some ecstasy. I kid you not. So here's what happens. Like, I've basically, like, wrapped up me and my mom's destiny. I'm getting ready to go to Iowa State. Like, I've achieved our dream. Like, I'm the toast of the town. Like, Monica Morrissey made it. Like, computer science major, Iowa State University. Like, he did it. I take this pill of ecstasy, and it does for me everything that the scholarship was supposed to do. You know what I mean? Because, like, up until that point, like, for me, sobriety was, like, brutal like sobri- like sober existence without god or drugs is god or alcohol is brutal without the relief that i get from drugs and alcohol or the relief i get from the god that you guys are giving me right now it, it's brutal but here's the real tragedy of it right like the world tells me that if i do x y and z i will feel like x y and z but i do x y and z and i don't feel the way everyone looks so when I took that ecstasy and when I started drinking, I felt betrayed by everyone that ever said they loved me. Because how could you, how could you, how could you have lied to me for so long and tell me if I get a scholarship, then I'll be fine. If I talk like Americans, then I'll be fine. If I sound like Americans, then I'll be fine. Because that's what I worked on. And that's honestly, uh, it, it, it's a side wheel of like, like my accent. I got rid of my accent in like in less than a year and a half because I got tired of being mocked. And so like if if I talk like Americans, then I'll feel okay. And then I changed my name. Like I was a big fan of Rocky. And they kept, I would tell people my name is Morris. And they'd say Morris. I'm like, no, Morris. He's like, Morris. I'm like, call me Ivan. <laughs> From Rocky, when I kid you not. And that's how I came, that's how I came along the name Ivan. And so I'm just giving an idea of the length I was willing to go to arrange the outside world so that I could feel a certain way. And so when I, t- take that drink and I take that ecstasy, that's exactly what happened. I felt the way I'd always wanted to feel. And I know today, for me, that was my first spiritual experience. Because the way I define spiritual is that it's something that's not of this world, right? And when I say not of this world, like, I'll put it simply. I love my daughter beyond measure. I love my mother beyond measure. I can't quantify it. You couldn't write me a check and give it to me. You couldn't write, you couldn't deduct it from my bank account. You can't in a quantifiable way take it away from me. To me, that's spiritual. It's those things that define my human existence that money can't buy. I can't quantify, but I will tell you and you will see through my actions mean more than anything in the world to me. And that's exactly how it began. So when I, when I, when, I, when I first got loaded, it got me in touch with something that the world had failed to deliver. And that's how I got introduced to the idea of what a God is supposed to do in my life. Because for me, more often than not, my God is defined more by function than by theory. You know what I mean? Like, it's what a God does within my life that then defines what it he or she or whatever the hell it is. Because when it's all said and done, it's unless it performs miracles on the plane of my actual daily life, what good is it? Like we might as well be like 
debating like democracy and like plutog and, and any of those things. So after I get loaded, I proceed it, I pursue it into the gates of insanity or death, man. And it um I end up going to college and I fail out. I get to Iowa State and I was there for barely even a year and a half. At the end of that year and a half, it's all starting to fall apart. I get back home, and by that time, my mom had been had moved to Las Vegas, and um, she had moved to Las Vegas to take care of like my um, my nephew because their parents had passed away. She's in this house in Las Vegas, and like Morrissey comes home, and I remember her standing in the kitchen as I walk back in, you know, with my bags packed, like having destroyed our dream. And she's like, Morrissey, what are we going to do? Hmm? Morrissey, what do we do now? Where do we go? Like, what, what do we have left? Thank you so much. What do we have left? And that was my introduction to exactly what disease can do. And that was my introduction to the idea that self-reliance can fail me. Because for the first time in my life, I had destroyed our dream. Like nothing meant more to me than this scholarship. Nothing meant more to me than that. Without this scholarship, like me and my mom, me and mom had nothing. Because you got to understand, with like for, for me and mom, like up until I had my family, like we're all we got. You know what I mean? When I left Auntie Connie's house and went off to college, like this was all we had. And I had destroyed it for this, for the feeling, the effect produced by drugs and alcohol. And I didn't know it at the time, but then it was like... It's one of those things that always bugs me. I'm like, spiritual malady. I'm like, yeah, it's a spiritual malady. But if I don't believe in God, how can I suffer from a spiritual malady? So someone needs to either redefine spiritual or they're like, the sum's not adding up. You know what I mean? Like, it makes no sense. Because I was a militant atheist, bro. Militant atheist. Like, well-read. Like, in ninth grade, after school, I would go over with my English teacher and debate. I kid you not. Debate like Kant, Descartes, you name it. Like Nietzsche. You, like, I, I was like the sole member of my high school objectivist club. And you're wondering, like, what's of the activist club? If you ever read, if you ever heard of Ayn Rand and like the theory of objectivism, like the, if you've heard of the novel Atlas Shrugged, Fountainhead, that rings a bell to anyone. Like, I was the founding and sole member of Para Memorial High School Objectivist Club. <laughs> but the, the, the principal core of, of objectivism is self-reliance. And it absolutely worked until I encountered drugs and alcohol. So in that time, like, in, in the mix of that, I, I get sent to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, like, I was, I was barely 21. I'm in Las Vegas. And, like, I kind of start dancing around AA. And, like, I get to AA and they're like... God, God, like God, God, <laughs> it's another church, but get out of here, I'm like, I'm an intellectual mafia, I'm like, we want to talk God, I'm like, we'll talk God, I'm sure I'll show you why that's useless, <laughs> but I can't stop drinking, like, give me something real, <laughs> you know, like, I'm not here to traffic in ideas, like, I know how to traffic in ideas, I know what I, I'll debate you all day long, like, God, as I understand him, I know what you're saying, but you see what I thought they were, like, when I heard God, I thought they were saying, you need to agree with something that you don't agree with, that's what I thought they were saying, but thankfully, like, my, my sponsor Dave, like, my, yeah, my sponsor Dave was like, no one's really asking you to agree with anything. And then, then what are they asking? You know what I mean? And it's like, it, 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 it's, it's, like <laughs> it's like a riddle. But because here's what happens. Like, I'll give you an example. You take two people, right? We'll call first person A, the first person's B, right? Person A, you sit in a room and you like break out a chemistry set and a bunch of chemistry books. And you break down the pharmacology of how alcohol works. And you educate him precisely to where he can pass any test on how alcohol works, right? Person B, you sit them in a room and you just pound them with shots of vodka. Pound just shot after shot after shot, right? When they come out of the room, right, who knows what it feels like to be drunk? And that was the same thing with like me and this God thing. I'm like, everyone's discussing and talking about an idea. I'm hearing people talking about an idea. But what they really mean is that I need to have an experience. So it's like, it's hard to call us. I'm like, okay. Okay. All right. I need to. I'm like, you keep. 
But how can I believe in something, have an experience? It's like saying, do you believe in alcohol before I drink? You know what I mean? I'm like, it makes no sense. Like, it, I can't fight for something I've never experienced. It, I don't understand it. So long story short, I go in and out. I go in and out. I go in and out. And, I, and it, eventually I became that guy. So like, you, like, pick your favorite meeting, right? You know, like in the beginning, right? The first time a person's new. Ivan, three days. <laughs> so glad I found it. <laughs> Everyone's rolling up like, oh my, we love you. He's so young and he's from Africa. Oh my God. <laughs> That's like the first time. Like the 12th time you relapse. They're like, hey, Ivan. Glad you're here. <laughs> Good to see you. Where's your mom? Do you have a ride? <laughs> I joke about it now, but it wasn't funny then. Because I know what it means to sit in these rooms and hear people describe a miracle that's inaccessible to you. I know what it means to sit in these rooms and have people say, are you ready? Do you get it? When will you get it? I know what it means to feel the injustice of people demanding of you a miracle that they say they didn't have for themselves, but they're asking you to have for yourselves. Because I know the torture of sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, having people say they give gratitude to God for getting them sober and asking me why I'm not serious. I know that tragedy because I lived it. And I know what it is to sit in the rooms and resign yourself to the fact that there's something just wrong with you, that there's just something you need to understand. But I'm also fortunate enough to have, have, to have had people in the rooms that understood that there's a line between where God's grace begins and their will starts. Some people that fundamentally understood that at some point they can't fully, completely, 100% take credit for the day that they got sober. And those are the people that found me. And one of them was Dave. So the last time I'll go out, by this time, like I had chased my mom out of Las Vegas, literally. She we would just do the same dance and do the same dance. And I would relapse and, and, and break her heart one more time. And she's calling every hospital in Las Vegas. And, and you have to remember, this is within like a two-year span of us receiving the letter for my full scholarship offer. This within two years, her son is now homeless and roaming the streets, alcohol and crack addict. She has no idea where she is. It's her only son. It's her only reason for living, and she's dying. So the last time I relapsed, I called mom one more time, and by this time, the whole family was telling her to abandon me. I called mom, and she's like, Morrissey, you've been my life since the day you were born. Morrissey, you're everything to me. But I know now that even if I gave my life for you, that would not help you get sober. So I don't know what else to do, because Morrissey, you're killing me. Morrissey, you're killing me. And we both can't die. Goodbye. Don't call me anymore. Click. And my mom hung up on me for the first, for the first, for the first time in my life. My mom wanted nothing to do with me. And I roll in, I, I, I kind of break into the house and I take every pill in the medicine cabinet and I try to kill myself. I remember Dave comes to pick me up and by this time, like, I was relegated to the back corner and I was like the relapser and the, like, the kid that doesn't get it and he comes to meetings high. I'm like, whatever person that you even have half written off, whatever person that you think has no respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, whatever person you think has no respect for the miracle, that's me. And that's what I became. And um, so I decide I'm going to kill myself and I don't die. I remember I, I, the only person left in the world that was still taking my call was Dave. And I called Dave one more time. And I'm like, Dave, I don't know what to do. I can't die. You know, I can't die, Dave. I can't die. And I remember he picks me up and we, we were sitting in his car and, and um, I'm banging my head on his dashboard, dude, banging my head on his dashboard back and forth just saying, Dave, I can't die. I can't die. Because for me, like, after mom gave up on me, I'm like, I hate what I am. 
I hate what I am. And at the end, I didn't want to die. It was no longer about just not staying sober because my disease is a specialist in taking the things I love and with my own hand, destroying them and then leaving me with this gaping, painful, burning hole that's just like metastasizes as this like horrific self-hatred that only if you felt can you understand. And if you've never done what I did, I cannot describe. That's where I was. And if you know it, you know that death is a mercy. And if you know it, when people say, you're going to die, you're like, please, please, I'd give anything to die, anything to die. And I can't even die. And they sits in his like beat up car with me and we're sitting there and I'm banging my head on his dashboard and he's like come here and then Dave's like this older Jewish guy right and so he uses like these like beautiful Yiddish terms so he calls me boy chick and um it, it's like a, a term of endearment for a young a young like a young man in in, uh, in Yiddish he's like boy chick come here and we're sitting in his car and he just gives me this big hug and I rest my head in his like orange work chart and I remember the spots of my tears I remember the blots he's like I know you don't see it kid I know you don't believe it but just believe that I believe know that I love you there's something in you worth saving kid there's something in you worth saving so just believe that I believe and come to another meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous And that God that I was talking about when I got up here, that's how he found me. Because he sent an angel in the only way I could accept him, which was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's how I met God. And that's how he found me. And I believed Dave. I believed Dave. Because he didn't talk to my head. He didn't try to convince me of anything. He just said... I love you. And the volume of the sound of his love was louder than my self-hatred by the simple fact that he was physically there. Because I thought to myself, I love and respect this man so much that if he can sit there with me, this piece of garbage that I think I am, then maybe there's hope. And that's how God saves me. And I've begun doing Alcoholics Anonymous, dude. And I remember like Dave gave me like my to-do list. It was simple. Call three alcoholics every day. Don't lie to you to steal. If you lie to you to steal, call your sponsor and see how you can make it right. Read two pages of the big book and pray every day. I was like, but I don't even guys like, I don't just get on them knees, bro. I just don't even worry about it. And I started doing AA, man. And I started doing AA and I did, um, what we did is we moved into, I moved into a halfway house called Silkworth House. I had one check in that was still in the mail. I grabbed this check and, and we literally go to the mailbox. We get this check and we go to Silkworth House. And Silkworth House, like, to call it a halfway house is kind of like, it's also exaggerating. It was just a big ass dorm, dude. 10 beds on one side, 10 beds on the other side, a closet every two beds. Like, sort yourself. We go to Silkworth House and I start doing AA, man. And I start doing AA and bit by bit, bit by bit, dude. And I hadn't seen 30 days in like two years. Chronic relapser. Bit by bit, I get 10 days. You know, bit by bit, I get more days. Bit by bit, I get more days. And it, um, 28 days, 29 days, 30 days comes around. And I'll never forget where I was. 30 days, Green Valley Group, Las Vegas, Nevada. And they're like, does anyone have 30 days? I remember like this bolt of lightning went through them. I was like, I do. I do. Like, I have 30 days. I have 30 days. I remember AJ was at the front and like, she's still sober to this day. I remember giving her this big old bear hug. I'm like, I have 30 days. I have 30. Like I'd like broken an Olympic record or something. You know what I mean? I have 30 days. I have 30 days. I remember getting back to Silkworth House and like getting to like my half of the closet. You know what I mean? Like crumpling up and just crying and just crying. Because for the first time in my life, I felt like I had something acting on my behalf other than me. 
because my mother never had, my father never had, my education had failed me, everything had failed. But I was doing what you people said, and I had some joy for the first time in my life that wasn't as a result of my intellect. And that's how God found me. I remember calling Dave, like, scream, like, Dave, Dave, he found me. He found me, Dave. God found me. He found me. I can get sober, too. I can get sober, too. You know, like, my miracle. My miracle. And, like, I started to do AA, and I started to do AA. And I remember every Sunday, like, me and Dave would go out to, uh, would sit in his car, like, I'm staying sober, I'm staying sober, and we'd be calling mom, and we'd be calling mom, and you dial the number, you know what I mean, like, 702, like, 3497601, like, I had it memorized, ring, 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 voicemail, you have reached 702, da, 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 and I'd leave her a message, like, mommy, it's Morrissey, I just want to tell you, I love you, I have 60 days sober, Mommy, it's Morrissey. I just want to tell you, I love you. I have 90 days sober. Mommy, it's Morrissey. I just want to, I love you. I have four months sober. And she's still not taking my calls. And she's still not taking my calls. And then somewhere around like six months after I've moved out of Silkworth house, she answers. We call. It's like, hello? Like, my dear boy, how are you? Mommy, I'm good. I have almost six months. She's like, that's good. You know, Morrissey? I'm moving to Uganda. I've decided to go back. But before I go, I want to come see my son. Can I come see you? I was like, yes, yes, yes. She's like, okay, okay. Um, I'll, I'll book my flight and then I can get a taxi. And I'm like, she didn't know. She didn't know that like I'd moved out of the halfway house and like I had a car now. I'm like, no, no, I'll pick you up. And she's like, how? Who's going to give you a car? I'm like, I'll, 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 I'll pick you up, mom. I'll be there. She's like, okay. She's like, no, I'll be there. And I kept saying it. I'll be there, mom. I'll be there. I'll be there. And as I said it, it started to sink in. I had become her son again and I was going to be there. And I was saying it from the caverns of my soul. And there was nothing in the world that was going to keep me from keeping that promise to the to my mom because now i had the composition of character that allowed me to be the son that i always wanted to be that precious thing that my disease had stolen you guys and god had given me back and that's exactly when i say when i met god that's how god found me because I need to see magic. The same way when I took that pill of ecstasy, I saw magic. And I got in touch with something the world couldn't give me. When I was telling my mom, I'll be there, I'll be there. I got in touch with something even my disease couldn't give me. No pill or drug in the world could, could feels like the restoration of my character. Nothing. Nothing. And I was there, bro. I was there like an hour early. I kid you not. McCarran Airport standing in that parking lot just like watching the stars watching every plane go by I'm like is she in that one is she in that one and honestly I didn't care I could have watched a thousand planes for a thousand years I knew I had made it and eventually she came and she got off she get, got off that plane and I was like renting a room from a guy and I went and bought new sheets and everything and like let my mom sleep in the bed and I've never been so happy to sleep on a couch in my entire life. You know what I mean? And I made her probably like the worst eggs she's ever had, but I made them. You know what I mean? And she ate them. <laughs> like with that cute African mom smile, bro. You know what I mean? And um, I took her like, because by this time I'm like six months sober and like for me, everything that I ever cared about, Alcoholics Anonymous had given me back. So all I knew was AA. So I'm like, I don't know what other people do when their mom comes visit, but like, we're going to meetings, mom. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's exactly what we did, dude. I like, took her on tour. I'm like, I, I'm like, I was like an AA fanatic. For me, like two meetings a day was like child's play. But I was like, no, we'll only go to two. We won't do three. So I, I took her around and I took, I showed my mom off to meetings and like, I thought I was showing my mom off to meetings. But when I would take her to meetings, people would pull her to the side and they'd say, we love Ivan. Let's tell you about Ivan. And after, you know, when a meeting ends, like I'd been trained to like go chase the newcomer. Don't talk to your friends, even if your mom's around, go to chase the newcomer. So I'd be going to chase the newcomer and I'd see this crowd of people around my mom. I'd always be like, what are they saying? 
I'm like, all right, now at least they're keeping her busy. And it's when we'd get in the car after those meetings. And my mom would take us. She's a traditional African woman. She'd have a little handkerchief. And she's pat wiping tears from her face. She's like, I'm so proud of you, Morrissey. I don't know what happened. But whatever these people are doing, I hope it never stops. Because they love you, my boy. And they love you the way I've always loved you. She goes, they know who you are. I didn't even know the man you guys were creating. I didn't. And my mom got on a plane a little while later and moved back to Uganda. And I started, and I kept doing AA, dude. And I kept doing AA. And I remember when I moved out of the halfway house, when I moved out of Silkworth house, it was like, if you've come up through halfway houses, like from nothing, you know, move out day is a big deal. Like your first place after a halfway house is a big deal. It could be a closet, but it's your closet. You know what I mean? Like you do whatever you want with it. So like when I move out, I'm like, I'm renting this room. And like, I hadn't had my own bathroom in a long time. So now I have my own bathroom. You know what I'm like? Oh my God, I gotta, I gotta decorate it. You know what I mean? I gotta do all this stuff with it. And it, um, I, uh, I go to Walmart and I buy a bunch of stuff. Like I, I put it in this, in this bathroom. And like, if you've ever like rebuilt your life on a budget, you know that like, just move out of a halfway house starter kit. You know what I mean? It's like that, like that, you know, it's that home, that, that kit that has everything, like toothbrush holder, birth, like, like the, the, the shower curtain, all that stuff, like all together. You know what I mean? It's like all there. It's all together. And it, um, I buy it and I remember getting home and like being so excited and like telling Dave like, oh my God, oh my God, Dave, like I'm so happy. Like I have this amazing bathroom and it all matches. Like look at this, the, 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 the toothbrush holder, the bathroom mat, all of it, it all matches. I remember he's going, wow, wow. And I remember falling to my knees that night and saying, God, please, if I can just do this for someone else, if I can just do this for someone else. And I was like, a few months after that, I'm, I'm doing H and I's and I'm doing all this stuff. And I meet a guy at a, at a halfway house and he, and he, at the, at the, um, at a West Care Detox and he, he decides to get out and I take him to Silkwell House where I got sober and he gets six months sober. And when the, when he, uh, when he's starting to move out, he keeps calling me to come to his place to like look at all his stuff. And I'm like, oh wow. I'm like, okay, Thomas, I'll come, I'll come. And eventually when he comes, he takes me to his place and like, I kid you not. He walks me to the bathroom. He goes, check this out. It all matches. You know what I mean? And like, I have this vision of where God and his angels are walking around, right? And they're just looking at all these addicts, like one after the other. And here's what they're deciding. Here's who's going to get sober. And we all know they don't give the, everyone this gift. Who knows why they pick? Who knows how they pick? But anyway, they're going around picking. They're like, they come to Ivan, right? Like, doo, 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 doo. And God's like, Ivan, give him the gift. And then he's like, oh, hell no, not Ivan. Do you know how many chances he had to get sober? Look at what he's done to his mom. He's throwing away a scholarship. He doesn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve any of it. And in that moment, when Thomas is like, look, Ivan, it all matches. God, I'm, I can just picture God poking his angels like, mm-hmm. That's why I did it. It's not because he's perfect. But in this way, I can use him perfectly. And that's why he did it. You know what I mean? And that's how God found me. And that's why God found me. Long story short, I stay sober. I end up like building an amazing life. Within four years, I buy a home. I buy a bunch of, I remember getting a brand new like red convert. My life, I'm on a rocket ride. My salary like quintuples. Like I get, I get everything within four years. At eight years sober, but I get a call from my mom in Uganda and she's like, he wants to see you. I'm like, who? Like your dad. I'm like, my who? Like I never had a dad in my life. So even like for her, someone was saying my dad was foreign to me. I had to like recompute. Oh, my father. I'm like, oh, wow. Long story short, I pack up everything and I decide to move back to Uganda. And here's why I moved back to Uganda. Because when I, I, I w when I, I had visited Uganda a few times and my dad would show me all this wonderful stuff and show me all these beautiful things. And he kept working on me, working on me. He's like, I need to have my son again. Come, move back. 
take over my empire, all this nice stuff. And long story short, I moved back to Uganda. And um, when I moved back to Uganda, here's what starts to happen. Like start, when I finally get there, it turns out that everything he was saying was a lie. By the time I finally moved there, all the stuff he'd showed me wasn't his. It was all a lie. And when I, I, I leave my whole life in Las Vegas and I move to Uganda, which is what, right about when I met Jordan. But I find this out like about basically a year later. And in that year, I end up losing everything I had worked for in sobriety. Every physical thing I owned, I lost. I remember the dark day when I, I'm calling my bank and they're like, we have initiated a default, blah, 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 blah. Like, I, and I, I lose my house. I lose my car. All my, my savings are burned out. And here's, I, here's how I found out. So in Uganda, like, well, in most of Africa, they have this thing called malaria, right? If you don't, I'm sure you've heard of malaria. Like, it's Seattle, Gates Foundation. They're big on, they, they, big on malaria. So anyway, it can, it, it's not like the worst disease in the world, but it, 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 it's simple to treat. But if you don't have the money, it can easily kill you. So hanging out of my dad's place, I get malaria. Like, the medicine is like barely $5. By this point, I've burned through my savings. I've burned through everything. And I walk, I walk up to my dad. I'm like, I need medicine for malaria. And he's like, let me go get some money. This is like 10 in the morning. And by 3 in the afternoon, he hasn't come back. I'm like, oh, my God. Then it really sunk in like I've lost everything. And I'm 8 years sober at the time. And I have nothing. Like coming on 9 years sober. And I'm stuck in Uganda and I'm about to die of malaria. I remember calling my mom and like asking my mom for money. And by this point, before I left to come to Uganda, I had been sending my mom money. So that now I'm in Uganda and I have no money. We have nothing. And there's nothing to keep anything going. So now I'm calling my struggling mom, who I was keeping alive, and asking her for money so that I can stay alive. And I'm 8 years sober. And I remember I would sit in meetings and like say all these great lines like, A has made me rich in all the things money can buy. (laughs) Bro. Bro. (laughs) Till you lose all the things money can buy. (laughs) Like, till you lose all the things that money can buy. (laughs) Like, then you really get to find out how much you believe that line. Long story short, I end up stranded. I move out of my dad's place. I move to like, because he lived out in the middle of nowhere. I moved to like this like middle, like middle of nowhere place. Like, and I'm far from the capital. So like, you're wondering, do they have AA there? No, none, zip, zero, zero, nothing. No AA whatsoever. And um, I'm praying to God. I'm like, I'm, I get malaria a, few, a bunch more times and I'm praying to God and I'm trying to figure it out. And, and um, I'm calling Dave. I'm like, Dave, it's all over. Like I've lost everything. And by then I'd sold most of my belongings. I was living, I was living in a half finished house. One half was mud. One half was like, like cement, basically like concrete. And um, he's like, kid, let me send you some big books. I'm like, you know what to do. I'm like, all right, send them books, bro. Let's see what we do. And I print out a bunch of flyers and I'm like, then I start to get re-energized. I'm like, yeah, like I'm going to be the, it's a town called Busia on the border of Uganda and Kenya. Like I'm going to be the Bill Wilson of Busia. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to start AA here. And, um, but like, here's the first problem, my accent, like to you guys, I sound perfectly intelligible, but to a traditional African that barely understands English, I might as well be speaking French. So here's the first challenge. If you want to go 12-step someone, they have to understand what you're saying. <laughs> so here's what I do. I'm like, I'll get an interpreter. But people need <laughs> the poverty in Uganda is real. So I'm like, I'm, I end up having to like get money. Like, they, like, <laughs> like basically raise money for my mom. And like they would send a little bit of money here and there. I'm like, I, I literally hire an interpreter to go on these 12-step calls. And I start doing it. And like you go on those 12-step calls and I'm telling you like, Take everything you know about getting sober. Think of every 12-step call you've ever been on, right? All the stuff you jazz yourself. I'm like, I know the steps. I know this. I know that. Da, 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 da. And then try to do it through an interpreter. You know what I mean? Like it, like, it will literally boil down to, like, the core of what Alcoholics Anonymous is. So I'd be there, like, like I would say one thing, and I'm, like, looking at the interpreter. Like, is he getting it? Is he getting it? Is he getting it? Is he getting it? Long story short, like... I do a couple of things. What I end up doing is I end up educating a bunch of pastors and a bunch of priests who's ended up working out in the long term. But in the short term, I didn't get anyone sober. And like the last time before I moved to the capital to like try to start on a life, I go on this 12-step call like, 
and before I go on like 12 step call, it'd be like, I'd literally call, like I'd tell all the pastors and I'd tell like, the interpreter to tell all these people, is there anyone drunk in the town? Blah, blah, blah. And eventually like we go to this house and before I go in t- to like use the interpreter, like for the fifth time to fail and be frustrated before I walk in, the lady's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you a doctor? Like, no. Like, no, tell her, no, I'm not a doctor. I'm like, hey, 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 drinking, hey, 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 hey. She's like, okay, is he a pasta? I'm like, no. Like, no, I'm not a pasta. Like, hey, 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 drinking, drinking. It's like, okay, um, how much does he charge? I'm like, I don't, I don't charge anything. And she's like, then what does he do? I'm like, wh- I'm going to talk to him. She's like, Just talk. She's like, go, go. And she didn't let me talk to the guy because what we offer is free. Do you understand? To us, to where AA is a part of the cultural lexicon, the fact that it's free is a feature. But you have to understand that in places where AA isn't part of the culture, the fact that this is free is a flaw. It makes them question the value of what we offer. We have experiences perfectly understand. So the one thing I started to understand is that when I like, I always say that I'm God's favorite. When I look at the quality of my life and all the miracles that God has performed for me, one of them was getting to get sober in America. And prior to that was coming to America. Because I got to be part of American culture, I was open to what you had to offer. There was a meeting when I went there. You know what I mean? And I came to realize that like, just the fact that you considered getting sober in this country, if there's no other proof that your God loves you, you will never believe any. I promise you that. And that's what I came to find out there. Like, oh my God, like, American culture is part of my 12th step. Unbelievable. And so I ended up moving back to the cap. I moved, I moved to the capital, and I and we we we, we do AA, do AA, and like it, it, it. I remember there, like I moved to the capital, and we're building, like AA is growing. And I remember going to like um, we start, we, we, we you see there, there when I'd say like we're like there would be like six of us, like in the country, bro, like in the country. Or as I say, I'm not I'm like I'm like in the country. So there, when you start a meeting. Someone's got to be sacrificed because you got to go to wherever hell we've got the meeting and you got to sit up. And so I get, I get sacrificed. I'm like, okay, it was one of the universities. I'm like, I'll start the meeting. But I'm like, I'll like, it's my turn because here's what starting a meeting means. You get up there, you meet the, whoever the, 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 the policy person is, you get your little pamphlets, you get your books, you set up first week. No one, just you whole hour, you, the book, pamphlets second week no one you the book pamphlets third week no one you the book pamphlets fourth week no one you the book pamphlets and you like you want to like understand how that feels like okay when we leave thoughts right you're gonna go home and you know when the next meeting is going to be right you know when your next meeting is outside of here. Now imagine if you know where the meeting is going to be, but you have no guarantee that there'll be anyone there. None. So then think of your home group and think of that one guy that gets on your nerves. You know, every time he opens his mouth, you're like, oh, oh, here he goes again. Oh, no, Bob, please, no, he, oh, oh, here he goes. He's the same passage. He's quoting it again. You know what I mean? So imagine after you leave thoughts, you go to that meeting, and for four weeks, no one shows up. And on the fifth week, that person shows up. Imagine what you'd say to them. Imagine how you treat them. That's my experience. And that's what I learned. And that's when I came to realize that when I tell you guys that I feel God in this building, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because what Uganda showed me is that each and every one of us is a true miracle. Because like, you know the saying we're standing on the shoulders of giants? 
right? We're surfing on a tidal wave of miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. Just think of thoughts. Think of the first people that came to the Pacific Northwest. I felt what they felt in Bosnia. Think of all the miracles each and every one of us is sitting on. Your sponsor, your sponsor, sponsor, all the way back. Pacific Group, whoever you want to talk about, all the way back. And think of the series of miracles that had to happen for the one not even your right and your left. Think of the person to your left, that one miracle to your left. And think of the endless series and chain of miracles that had to happen for one person to be sitting next to you. Forget this whole thing, just that one miracle. And I survived Uganda. Make a long story short, I end up working for a company. Um, they decide to relocate me to the US. A series of miracles, after nine years. Series of miracles. The guy literally, he calls me one day, he's like, um, if we put together the right offer and help relocate your family and paid for everything and da 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 da, would you consider moving back to the U.S.? I was like, I'll think about it. <laughs> and for like 48 hours, dude, I was sweating. Just talking to my wife, sweating. I'm like, I can't reply. I gotta make it seem like it's a tough choice. <laughs> 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 and almost like 48 hours to the dot. I was like, Yes, I'll do it. <laughs> and he's like, okay. They send me, a, this is April, April 14th of 2001. No, 2021. And he's like, so like seven days later, April 21st, he sends me an offer, incredible offer, more money than I ever thought I could ever make in the U.S. Like relocation, bone, all types of, just unbelievable, out of this world. And he's like, but there's one catch. You have to start in Austin, Texas on June 1st. This is less than 30 days. It's like, damn. But this time I'm like, I'm married, I have a daughter. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. I moved to Austin, Texas. Long story short, um, I land in May 31st, I land in Austin, Texas. June 1st, I start work. September. 12th or 13th, I was in the hospital with an eye infection that was about to destroy my eye, three different bacterial infections, and um, on sitting on death's door. Um, l long story short, I'm in a hospital bed, and the doctor's like, we don't know what we're going to do. We don't know how we can save your life. The first thing we're going to try to do is save your eye. And be before we save your eye, um, we also don't know what we're going to do about all these like viral infections because your temperature keeps rising. Because I had literally collapsed at home and my wife had to call a guy in AA to send me to the ER. Long story short, to save my eye, there's a like experimental surgery. There's only two people that can do it in the state of Texas. The one lady that can do it happened to be in Austin visiting her daughter that Sunday. They call her in, they perform the surgery, they save my eye. The ne next few days, they're like... It's, it's, it's hit or miss, like it, hit or miss. They're trying to find the right combination of like, 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 um, bacterial drugs to save my life. And eventually they hit on one and my life gets saved. And I stumble out of the hospital. I remember being on my deathbed and the, every day the doctor would come in. They're like, 106. Ah, oh, still nothing, still nothing, still nothing, still nothing. And eventually, eventually, they happen on the right combination of things that saves my life. I remember sitting in that hospital bed, like bawling, talking, like video call, like FaceTime with my wife, saying like, oh my God, God, how could you bring me to America to die? After all I've been through, after all I've survived, after all I've done for you, because I've done everything right, I've always served you, I've always rolled it like, you bring me to America to die. And I realized three weeks later when I walked out of that hospital, and they, I was in the hospital for three and a half weeks, like four weeks later, they send me a bill for like 267000 dollars uh, but like that's those that the total amount but the like amount owed by patient three thousand dollars i was like huh it's like oh america has insurance <laughs> like that's right and here's what i realized god hadn't brought me to austin to die he brought me to austin to live and oddly when that my manager put that condition that I had to move by, by January, by June 1st, so that he could put me in that quarterly payroll. He actually saved my life. And the reason that I had to leave my family, and my family is still there due to COVID, the paperwork's taken so long to process. The reason I had to leave him there was so that I could live. So when I tell you that I'm God's favorite, I've got some serious evidence to back that up. <laughs> Truly. Truly. So no, 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 I'll shut up with this. Like, to anyone who's new, 
like I always end, whatever happens, just don't die. Come to one more meeting. Try one more time. And if you're wondering what we think, don't worry about it. We could never hate you as much as you hate yourself. And we will never heal you as much as you will heal yourself. And I hope that everything I'm saying sounds impossible. And I hope that what I'm asking, what I'm describing, the restoration, the things you want, the things they're saying AA can do seem impossible. Because, and I hope they seem like a miracle. Like as if I cut off your arm and you grow a new one. Because when they happen for you, I want you to find Jordan and find that crazy Ugandan guy and put your list of miracles on the table and say, no, Ivan, I'm God's favorite. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.